5,000 subscribers of Comcast will be giving a trial of a new on-demand service called On Demand Online, wherein people can watch full episodes of different cable networks using Comcast service. Most notably, CBS has signed on and they've kind of been the holdout. They're not available on Hulu. They have their own property called TV.com where you can stream full episodes of CBS content. But Comcast is trying to make an end run and start bundling content together so people can access it from anywhere. Is this going to work or is this more of a you know, shot in the dark? Let's talk to a couple technology journalists, both from Engadget HD. We bring in Ben Drabaugh. Ben, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Also, we bring in Richard Lawler from Engadget HD as well. Richard, thanks for being with us. Great to be here. So this situation is kind of unique in that there are, you know, Comcast is really making a push to be one of the first to have, uh, you know, a majority of cable networks behind this service. Ben, why do you think Comcast, you know, what's their motivation for doing this? And do you think that people will be benefiting from this? I think that they realize that people want more ways to access their favorite shows and that if Comcast doesn't provide them bundled in with their normal services, they risk being replaced or at worst being the, a, uh, as they would hate, a bit provider. Yeah, where they would just kind of be like an ISP and they just give you your internet access without much else. I don't know, Richard, how do you think this works out for people who, like you and me who you know, just want to watch TV shows on the internet? Is this good or is this kind of anti-competitive because you look at you know, Hulu's for free, uh, TV.com's for free, this service you have to pay for, well, I mean, it's part of your cable subscription. But if you don't have that cable subscription, you can't get access. And that's that's the real conflict here. Um, I think people will like to get more for what they pay for, you know, the capability. Clearly, everyone wants to be able to watch. Like DVRs have taken away having to watch when something's on. But with this, hopefully, that takes away having to be at home or near your TV. Um, but on the downside, obviously, free services like Hulu or on the various networks' websites, where a lot of them already stream a lot of their shows, if it takes away contact from there or content from there, and they put it on these you know, pay TV walled garden sites, then that's not really good for consumers. So how do you think this is going to work, Ben? I mean, do, what do we know exactly about, is it just a login? Is it based on your IP address from where you're at? How is this actually going to work for people wanting to watch content? Do we know that? I don't know that one. Maybe Richard knows that one. Is it, I mean, have they, they haven't really established a model yet, have they? Uh, they haven't really released any details on that. I think that's basically what a lot of the trial is, is figuring out how the authentication system will work. Because that's been a lot of the questions, how, how they'll handle that. You know, so obviously you can view it from anywhere, uh, and, and that's the point of this 5,000-person trial, or at least a big part of it. Yeah. So uh, there's other services out there that currently do something similar to this, right? There's ESPN 360, which is probably the most notable. There you have to actually have an ISP that supports ESPN 360. Most notably, Verizon FiOS is one of those, as well as a few others. Though cable carriers have been hesitant to add it to their lineup. Now, Richard. How do you think ESPN 360 has worked so far? And do you think that, you know, people, I mean, I've personally been frustrated because I can't sign up for ESPN 360 at all. Like, I don't have BIOS availability. I don't have a way to actually get it. Do you think that, you know, with things like this Comcast on-demand online, do you think it's going to frustrate more people? Or, you know, are they, I, I don't know, is this going to be widely deployed enough that it's going to matter? Well, hopefully it'll be widely deployed enough that, uh, people will have access to it if they want because I'm in the same boat as you. I, I can't get files and Comcast doesn't offer uh, ESPN 360 yet so I, I can't use it. Uh, for most customers if they already this on-demand online, this TV Everywhere project is like between Time Warner and Comcast so hopefully it'll spread to other cable companies as well so that people can sign up for it if they want and if they don't, you know, obviously ignore it. I think the big difference here, though, is that ESPN 360 is about getting access to content that you probably normally wouldn't have, maybe like an out-of-market college football game or some other sport like that. I have access to it, and I've used it for that before. Um, but whereas the new Comcast model is more about accessing the exact same content you already have access to, but just in a new way so or at a different time. So let's talk about this from a content provider's perspective. Now, you know, right now, these, con these cable companies... Uh, not CBS specifically necessarily, but these cable companies have been compensated by access fees. Where you know ESPN is a great example. They charge up to four dollars per cable per for, per cable person per cable station. I'm not, I don't know if that makes sense. Basically, four person four dollars per person to you know get content, and that's that's fees that Time Warner has to pay ESPN to actually be able to license their content. And there's other ways that it works that are the opposite, wherein a cable provider actually has to pay Comcast to get on their channel lineup. Now, Ben, now, do you think content providers will kind of look at this 
as you know, a way to kind of prolong that revenue stream into the future? Or, I mean, is it to their advantage to kind of just open it up for everyone? I think it's more of them trying to protect that existing model. So they're saying, how can we leverage our current contracts that we have in place to offer people more ways to access the content and keep them from going to other sites and keep them from canceling their cable? See, that's the problem, though. For me, I just canceled my cable a couple of days ago. Literally, I don't have a cable TV anymore. I just have internet from Time Warner Cable in New York, which, I mean, I haven't had a great experience with, like, very many New Yorkers. Um, but, you know, so from my perspective, as a content producer, I think that this might actually be a good thing in that we could see, you know, sort of a, a two-tier approach. If, if a program gets good enough where, you know, with a, with a service like Boxy, maybe I distribute my content exclusively to Boxy, and then, you know, maybe I get so notable that I can compete with people like HBO and Showtime and kind of compete in this on-demand arena. Do you think that that kind of would be a good competitive environment for the consumer? And do you think that, uh, like, do you think that's enough incentive to really make things work, Richard? I, I think it could be. Uh, it, it could be a very interesting model where, you know, obviously people like you or, or other content providers can make shows or, or make movies or whatever they like and distribute them to a large amount of people without having to have access to these, you know, obviously closed off cable networks or getting, getting on a TV channel somewhere and creating a platform like On Demand Online or TV Everywhere or something like that is kind of the first step towards that. But still, the existing content providers, obviously, as Ben stated, they have their model that works and they want yeah. to protect that. So they don't really want you or <laughs> anyone else who would be on YouTube or, or wherever they're currently putting their things or indie movies or anything like that competing with them. And let's be honest, my show's probably the biggest threat to cable TV, I don't know, probably ever. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I, I would definitely agree with that. So, right there with our podcast. Yeah, exactly. So, Ben, how long do you think we're away from a true, you know, how, for this being ubiquitous everywhere, and before consumers can kind of expect this to roll out? I mean, obviously, it's still a trial right now. Do we have any idea of kind of timelines or expectations? No, but you would expect anything, like, at least to be available to all Comcast customers within 6 to 12 months, I would think. Yeah, I mean, that seems pretty realistic. Hopefully, we'll see what's going on there. Guys, we're out of time, so we're going to leave it there. Ben Draba from Engadget HD, also Richard Lawler, also from Engadget HD. Thanks, guys, for taking some time out of your busy schedules to talk to us at TechFeed. I'm Randall Bennett, and we'll see you next time on the show. We're on iTunes, and we're on YouTube. Subscribe to us, please. You'll like it, I swear. See ya.